Hi guys, this is Julia with the Ethical Consumer Podcast and I am here on site at the Single Speed Brewery in Waterloo, Iowa. And I am here with Rachel Beck and she is their sustainability coordinator and also their social media strategist. Thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me be here. We are a whole 12 feet apart. Those of you probably can't see that on camera right now and we masked it up until we sat in our chairs. So don't you worry, we're being safe. All right, thank you so much. Um, what was your first introduction to Single Speed? How did you get hooked up with them? How did you start doing some of their sustainability efforts? And how did you end up where you are today? Yeah, so I transferred to University of Northern Iowa about halfway through my college experience. Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was going for environmental science. Um, I had to have an internship to graduate. It was my senior year, I still hadn't found an internship. Um, managed to get an internship at the Iowa Waste Reduction Center and they had something called the Green Brewery Certification Project. And basically that was traveling to um, different breweries in Iowa and certifying them based on their sustainability initiatives. And so I did some projects with the Brewers Association and went into these breweries and benchmarked them compared them to other breweries of their size, um, ranking on their sustainability measures. And so I went and did that for single speed. Um, a couple months later, they had a conference called iBest, which was held at single speed. Um, and I think he was the sustainability ambassador for the Brewers Association. His name was Ian Hughes. We had talked a little bit before he got up on stage for like the keynote speech for iBest. And I told him that like I was graduating soon, still hadn't found a job yet, and he was like, well, I can just put in a good word for you. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like he'll talk to one person and like maybe I'll get a job. But uh, during the keynote speech, he mentioned that I was graduating soon, I hadn't found a job yet, I had worked with the Brewers Association, and if anybody was looking for any like sustainability help in their brewery, like hit Rachel up. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, that's a lot more than I thought would happen. Um, so after that keynote speech, Dave Morgan, the founder of Single Speed, approached me and was like, we are interested in sustainability, we'd love to have somebody like you on our team, we just don't know if that's a full-time job, sustainability. And I was like, I ran the Instagram account for Iowa Waste Reduction Center, I could probably do that. <laughs> Little did I know that they have three social media accounts, I was just running one Instagram. Um, so they took me on board for sustainability and social media. and. Here I am. That's excellent. Yeah. So not only did you get a recommendation, but you were recommended to an entire room full of people. Exactly. And yes. Dave thankfully <laughs> made his Plucked proposition. Plucked me out of and... the crowd. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. So you didn't start on the brewery and beer side of things. You started more on the sustainability side of things. Correct. Yeah. So you said that you were doing this internship with the Brewers Association in trying to benchmark and certify um, and inspire local breweries. Or was it a national level thing or was um, it just So it was local? just in Iowa. I know they're trying to expand it to be more of a local thing, but we primarily focus on Iowa breweries during that time. Okay, got you. Well, cool. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. It was just meant to be. Yeah, I guess so. And then so. you had the social media <laughs> side of it then yes. too. Yes, no prior Super. experience. So that was scary, but it all worked <laughs> out. <laughs> well, I'd say they took a good risk. Well, thank you. What has been your favorite part so far about being the sustainability person here at Single Speed? I would have to say how each day is something different. Um, it's not really like cut and dry. You come into work and know exactly what you're going to do. A lot of the times it's sometimes doing social media for four days in a row and then one day you don't have a lot to do so you really get a focus on sustainability and it's just kind of a nice mix of those two. It's not overwhelmingly sustainability or overwhelmingly social media. It's kind of a nice balance between the two, which sure. I really appreciate. You get to have a nice variety. Yeah. Oh, I think that's good. I think that's good for everybody. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so you came on partway through single speed being and becoming what it is. And they originally started in 2012 and they were just at the Cedar Falls locations. For those of you watching, if you are not aware, those of you listening, because we're doing this podcast and YouTube style, you were originally in a smaller brewery in Cedar Falls, and then later on opened into this wonderful space. Could you tell us a little bit about the original site, which is still in production and is, is functioning as a tap room 
as well. I understand it's a little smaller yeah. <laughs> than this one is. <laughs> yeah, so our Cedar Falls Tap Room is a three barrel brew house, which means every batch of beer that we make there can produce three barrels of beer. Um, so that's a relatively small amount compared to the 20 barrels that we can brew in Waterloo. Um, we primarily use that tap room for research and development, so that's where we'll try out new recipes, uh, tweak old recipes, and just do a lot of new stuff. Um, it's rated silver by the Iowa Green Brewery certification. Single Speed Waterloo is platinum, so uh -oh. <laughs> a bit of a difference there. Uh, we are working on getting that one to a higher ranking. But yeah, it's basically just a smaller tap room that we use for experimental beers, and it's a really cozy little place to hang out. Um, very different than Waterloo, but still equally as fun. Sure. <laughs> now, I think it's a really good testament to when you're starting up an operation of any sort, whether it's a brewery or a restaurant or some other company, sometimes you have to start small. And then once you're able to grow, hopefully, mm -hmm. you're allowed to do so. And then you step into bigger opportunities. And with that, sometimes um, you can offer more sustainability as right. far as your brewing process, your building, your energy sources. Now, I grew up in Cedar Falls. So this, I remember being the old rundown Wonder Bread yeah. factory. So this was not originally used for beer, mm -hmm. it was originally used for bread. <laughs> so we still have the carbs in there, yes. but in a different drinkable form. Can't get rid of the carbs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I understand Dave Morgan purchased this building for a dollar. Yes. Could you tell me a little bit about how he was able to do that, the transition from Wonder Bread to Single Speed and its historic significance? Yeah. So. Um, I do know that he wanted to expand the Cedar Falls tap room. Like he wanted a little bit of a bigger tap room. Um, I don't think his sights were ever set as big as the facility in Waterloo. Sure. Um, he was looking for other places. The people in Waterloo were really encouraging him. Like, we don't want to see this Wonder Bread factory go down. Like, can you help out? Can you maybe buy it? Um, so the city had it. He purchased it from the city, like you mentioned, for a dollar. Um, and then from there, just like slowly started creating a brewery. Um, he was pretty fortunate from the beginning, uh, like had the opportunity to purchase new tanks, um, just put in like all new high efficiency stuff. It wasn't like used stuff was coming in here. Um, he really had the opportunity to get new high quality things in here, which in the end made it more sustainable. So it was kind of like a fresh empty slate that he could do whatever he wanted with and I think made a pretty awesome brewery out of it. Almost definitely. And if, if anyone is ever to visit the Waterloo Tap Room, you walk in and you can see from the outside windows the site where they brew. You can see kind of some of the old Wonder Bread features too. Um, you've used a lot of the old Wonder Bread remnants in, in order to construct what you have here, which I would consider to be a very modern feeling space, but you have like the classics of the exposed brick from the original building. And you've, the bar, I think, the bar is made from some reclaimed wood? or Yeah, like the back of the bar, like where your legs would hit, that's all sure. reclaimed wood. Um, I think it was like 75% of the original building was retained. So we are a nationally registered historic site, so that's pretty interesting. Um, they had to do a lot of work um, with a historic preservation person. I don't know their official title, but <laughs> sure. um, yeah, they had to come in here and help out uh, because we also wanted to have a LEED certification. So typically those things don't go hand in hand, so it was a lot of work to get LEED certification, but also still remain a nationally registered historic place. Sure. I suppose with the nationally hit, national historic places, you have a whole lot of old utilities and old electric and things like that that need yeah. to be redone while still preserving the original infrastructure of the exactly. building. Exactly, yeah. So, oh man, props <laughs> to them for doing yeah. a good Glad job. Glad I wasn't here when that was happening because I'm okay. sure it was stressful. <laughs> <laughs> so you have success successfully blended the old school with the new school. Yeah. And it makes for a really wonderful place to sit down and have some food or have a beer. I frequented here in the Cedar Falls spot several times, so I appreciate, appreciate drinking my carbs. <laughs> <laughs> Now with the renovations, um, you were also able to create a meeting space, which is what we're in right now. And you're able to reach out to different nonprofits in the area or they're able to reach out 
to you, the one stipulation, as far as I understand, is they do have to be registered 501c3 nonprofit. So it is truly those who are using most, if not all, of their efforts to give back to the community or whichever foundation or organization that they work with. And this wonderful meeting space is free on Mondays. Free on Mondays, correct? yeah. Free on Mondays uh, in order to give places that would not originally have a space to work in, space to gather in community when times are not as they are right yes. now, safely <laughs> and respectfully gather in community. Exactly. So I think that's such a wonderful thing. And I know you, you guys have been a part of a lot of things in the Cedar Valley, which have really benefited a lot of people. So I think it's super wonderful. <laughs> in addition to the community, you also share the building with Sidecar Coffee Roasters. Yes, we do. So you have some partnerships with other businesses around the area that are producing food or malts or hops. Can you tell me about any of those ones? Yeah, um, so I will tell you about Yellow Table Farms because we've started to get so much lettuce from them and yes. it is the best lettuce I've ever had. Uh, Yellow Table Farms, uh, we have them for our kitchen. Um, Rainbow City Farms, there's another local mushroom. I can't remember the exact name of it, but we try to get local in our kitchen whenever we can. Um, obviously, it's just fresher produce, it tastes better, um, and we just like to support where we can. And um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's that for the kitchen. <laughs> And Eric from Yellow Table Farms is actually someone I know as well, and yeah. he's just one of the most wonderful people, and the bounty that they get from their fields, you know so much love and care yes. goes into it. So Even good. seeing the lettuce on their social media yeah. <laughs> is impressive. I can only assume the taste is, is just as awesome. So good. <laughs> And then you use Sidecar's coffee as well to brew a few of my favorites. Yeah. The Tip the Cow. Tip the Cow, a Tuhu. Um, anything that we have coffee in it, it comes from Sidecar Coffee Roasters, roasted like 600 feet away from where we put it into the beer. So it's super local, super fresh, and we just love the guys at Sidecar. Sure. Oh, they're awesome people. I love that. And in addition to Sidecar, you also have some partnerships with the Runner's Flat and a couple yes. other uh, active associations in mm -hmm. the area, whether it's associated with a store or just a running club or a bike club of sorts. So not only are you able to open up your facility to nonprofit organizations, but also give a home to, again, places that would not usually have a gathering space. Can you explain your pint nights and how those yeah. started? So pint night rides, um, they were partnered with Bike Tech in Cedar Falls and Waterloo Bicycle Works. Um, they're kind of on a hiatus right now as we don't really want to be gathering too much, but uh, sure. <laughs> hopefully soon we'll get back to those. Um, they're held the first and third Thursday of every month and basically we just get everybody here. Um, we go on a bike ride from Waterloo to Cedar Falls or you can start in Cedar Falls and come to Waterloo. And basically we partner with a nonprofit organization for the night. 10% of the proceeds from that night go directly towards them. We invite them out here to just kind of like talk a little bit about their organization, um, just a way to get their get their message across, talk to a few people, um, get some donations, and yeah, get a free beer at the end of it. There it's free go. to join, free to ride. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of fun. And then as far as being able to enjoy your beer when people aren't here or when people are in the tap room too, you have the availability of draft beer here and at several other locations. You also do your own canning and then you have growlers for people as well. So you can on site at this facility, the Waterloo facility, is that correct? Wonderful. So most of your things are done in-house, which also reduces the amount of waste that you produce in shipping because you're not shipping kegs or barrels to another canning location off-site. You're able to do everything here. And then you have a special relationship with hy V as well as far as recycling or doing away with your pallets, as far as I understand, and your shrink wrap, which is an interesting yeah. item. That's one of those necessary things, I'm afraid, but you have a way of dealing with it a little bit better because of your connection. Yeah, so shrink wrap is one of those things that's really hard to get rid of. Um, to be able to properly dispose it, you have to bale it and store it. 
and this is a big building, but we really don't have a ton of storage space here and to fit a baler in here and pounds and pounds of shrink wrap is something we really can't do at this moment in time. Um, so it took me a while to find a place to get rid of it. I just contacted hy -Vee and told them like what situation we were in and they were like, oh yeah, no problem. Like we have a baler here, just drop it off when you can. We'll bail it up for you and send it through our recycler. So it's really nice to have organizations like that in the community that you can just kind of reach out to. Um, we don't produce a ton of shrink wrap, but obviously whatever we can not throw in the garbage, we'd like to not throw in the garbage. And um, yeah, so we just reached out to them and they were super helpful and now our shrink wrap gets recycled how it should be. There you go. So if other places are interested in hopefully reducing their footprint and they're not able to recycle on site or they don't have the facility, the space, the baler, like you said, which I'm assuming is a rather expensive piece yes, of equipment, <laughs> they might be able to partner with someone else who's already doing that. Perhaps a partner that already sells their product or has, their, has some association um, with one of their, perhaps their producers or a farm that is doing some of that as well with some of their necessary evil created waste. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think that's a really good point to make as well is that everyone is really doing the best that they can with what they're able to do. And originally when it was the smaller brew house in Cedar Falls, there there were some shortcomings, I assume, not having as much space. And your kitchen as well, so having tiny. a very <laughs> tiny little kitchen there. The kitchen set up here is just absolutely amazing. But you're able to grow as um, you've got a bigger facility and you had more connections. And I think it's a really, really good testament to being able to um, do better when you can. And though we may be starting small, later on, who knows what the possibilities are. And one of, I think, a very special thing to single speed too is the fact that you, oh, you, you personally, Rachel, <laughs> Rachel personally installed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when they renovated the building, solar panels up on the roof, which that was not originally a, poss a, a possibility in Cedar Falls, just with this, this structure, there's actually an apartment above the Cedar Falls Brewery. Um, you were able to offset quite a bit of your, the electricity that you use using those solar panels. Yeah, so those solar panels offset about 16% of our total energy usage, which equates to about 100% of our brewing operations, which is kind of cool to say that our beer is solar powered. Um, we would like to have more on the roof. I think that's in the works for the plans, but with the um, historical preservation, there was kind of a rule that from ground level, you couldn't see the solar panels because that's how the building looked. And I think it was 1957 is the look that they were going for. And obviously they didn't have solar panels up there. <laughs> Maybe so, not. <laughs> so um, we had to stick with that and they can't be seen from the street. But after five years, we kind of have free range to do whatever we want with the building. And I think at that point, we're planning on extending a little bit off of the roof to get sure. some more solar panels on there. Being able to offset even more Yes. I mean, I think it's really awesome that currently your beer is entirely solar powered, yeah. like you said. On a good day, yes. On a good day. <laughs> so in addition to being able to come here to the tap room in Waterloo or the tap room in Cedar Falls, folks can find your beers at hy vees other big box grocery stores, and then some local beer shops as well, or smaller beer shops around the state of Iowa. Do you currently sell outside of the state of Iowa? We do not. We are still in the state of Iowa. Um, I think there are plans to expand, but nothing seriously in the works yet. Sure. Well, I think staying local is nice too because you have a little bit more control over the, the standard that you keep everything at here. So in addition to being able to find your beers at grocery stores and some smaller beer shops around the area, you are able to sell the six packs here at the Waterloo Tap Room and at the Cedar Falls Tap Room. And then you also, during non-COVID times, have growlers for sale and to use as far as filling up with beer so that people can take them home for right. the weekend or for a party that they may be having. Yeah. And though cans are recyclable, 
glass is a little bit more challenging to recyclable, but it is reusable. Right. Which some would say is less stressful because then mm -hmm. they don't have to take their cans to the recycling. Exactly. And do you, I, I think there's been a couple different renditions of a few of your beers that some have only been on tap mm -hmm. and not available in six packs. Right. Which is exciting because yes. then if you don't want to sit and hang out and have a beer, Glass you're able to, yes, you're able to take it home and have it there. What's been one of your favorites that's been a, like a seasonal or a special tweak or a special edition? Ooh. That's tough because I don't really make it over to the Cedar Falls Tap Room too often. Um, COVID times, we haven't really been brewing a lot of new stuff in there. We are starting again with some new stuff over there, so that should be coming soon. Um, I'm really gonna have to think about that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're throwing the tough stuff at me. I'm throwing all the tough <laughs> questions at you. I know, we like science here, man. And now it's like personal preference. One of my favorites was last year, um, I don't remember which one it was. Oh no, it was something with s'mores. Oh, I, know what, s'mores I know what you're one? talking about. There was a s'mores one, but now I'm forgetting the name of I it. I am too. My goodness gracious. It was one of like your sing signature. It wasn't it Tip was, the Cow, was it? It was for Tip the Cow Day. I don't remember what it was. Graham cracker sandwich. Graham cracker sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Literally a s'more. <laughs> that was one of my favorites. Yeah. That you're only able to get either visiting one of the tap rooms or having it in a growler. And I think it's fun that you're able to do all of these tweaks as you're still kind of an extremely uh, progressive and very capable, but still small yeah. and local operation. And in being small and local, you're not exporting out of Iowa right now, are you? No. No. So everything it's is all still here. staying yeah. pretty local. Nice in our little community here. Oh, good. <laughs> what do you What do you usually eat or drink if you are not having Ooh. some of your single speed? So I'm a big Sierra Nevada fan. Okay. Any Sierra Nevada beer, top notch. Um, <laughs> Sierra Nevada Summerfest. I had that one the other night. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I'm a fan of like the light Pilsners, crispy beers. Those are always good. So in addition to partnering with several stores, the Runner's Flat, with other food businesses like Sidecar Coffee, you have also partnered with a few other breweries in order to do a collaborative project on um, being able to raise funds for other organizations. Could you share a little bit about that? So I actually wasn't here when it took place, but um, we partnered with Sierra Nevada for their Resilience Beer, and that was brewed for the wildfires that took place in California. Um, I believe the beer was sold, 100% um, of the profits went back to Sierra Nevada. Um, they made the recipe, they shared the recipe with us, and we brewed the beer, sold the beer, and did all of that. And a lot of Iowa breweries took part in that one. Um, something that we have also taken part in is the Black is Beautiful beer, which was started by, I think, Weathered Souls Brewing in San Antonio. Um, and that was for the um, police brutality uh, that's been happening recently. Sure. Um, so that beer was another one where they came up with the recipe, they share the recipe, and we just kind of put a little tweak on it brewed the beer, labeled the beer, packaged it, and um, we're selling that in four packs and kegs right now. So you can get that in both of our tap rooms and 100% of those profits go to um, a local organization, Social Action Incorporated, which is located in Waterloo and they really focus on um, like youth empowerment, mentoring, all those kind of things in our area, which is a really awesome thing to be a part of for us. So in addition to being able to say that you have a fully recycled building, you have other projects around the tap rooms as far as sustainability goes and being able to reuse things, how to recycle things, and how you dispose of things in general. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so we have three waste streams that come out of our brewery. Um, we do single stream recycling, which basically means our staff can just throw everything together, plastic, glass, paper. Um, we compost, um, and obviously we have garbage. Uh, since we have a fully operational kitchen, we compost all of the food scraps that come in. Um, we compost food scraps from food prep if they aren't used in broths or things like that in the kitchen. Um, some special things about our brewery, we have sub meters in there so we can really nail down our water to beer ratio, which is basically like how much water do you put in and how much beer do you get out. 
I think the industry standard for that is like seven to one. So for example, seven gallons of water would make one gallon of beer. We're actually at six to one. So we still have a little bit of room for improvement, but we are doing better than the industry average. So that's kind of exciting. And it's really helpful to have those specific meters in the brewery to really nail down how much we're using because we are a large building. And if we just ran it off of the one water meter that comes in here, we'd never really be able to tell how much water the brewery was actually using versus the restaurant, the restrooms, everything like that. Sure. That makes sense. I think it's nice to be able to separate and see how each aspect of your business and of your facility is doing in order yeah. to see where you can do a little bit better, mm -hmm. when you can. Obviously, we're gonna wash everything, yeah. and there's, there's water that needs to go into the cooking process too. So brewing is really somewhere that you have control over your water usage, or at least being aware of it and making yeah. adjustments. Yeah, super water go. intensive process, uh, super energy intensive process, so the better we can like really nail down how much we're using, the easier it is to reduce how much we're using. Sure, now where does that water go? So it goes down the drain. We're okay. a small enough facility that we don't have to pre-treat our water. Um, we do have drains that catch everything that goes down if it's like large particulate matter, um, but all of it goes down the drain just like it would at your house. And then the city pre-treats it and that's the end of the water. <laughs> sure. So in doing that, you're able to know that you're, you're, wa you're also not sending anything into the water mains that aren't supposed to be there, Correct, yeah. Which is a problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which is a good thing to be able to prevent. Yeah. What do you have as far as advice goes for consumers, other entrepreneurs, if someone's interested in perhaps imploring the use of a sustainability coordinator or if someone is interested in being a sustainability coordinator? Yeah. So for consumers, I would really say um, look at the businesses that you're supporting. You might think like, that seems a little expensive for a beer or that seems a little expensive for a t-shirt. But a lot of times those prices are tacked on because they're taking the extra steps to make sure that they're producing a sustainable project or product. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, there's typically a reason why things are more expensive than you think that they should be. Um, and I think it's just always a good idea to really research where your stuff is coming from, what steps are they taking to be more sustainable. And yeah. Sure, I think that's wonderful. And then as far as being able to have any suggestions to perhaps other breweries without giving single speed secrets away, <laughs> what would be kind of a first step or even a second and third step that they could take if they're still new, if they're still trying to get off the ground, getting back in the black, out of the red? What's something that they could do that's fairly easy, you think, that would be one of the easiest things to begin? Yeah, so that takes me back to my uh, Iowa Green Brewery certification project days because a lot of times we would encourage them um, just monitor everything like a lot of times if you just look at your water bill every month look at your energy bill every month and kind of compare that to how much beer you're making like does it seem like it's following a trend are there places where you might be wasting a little bit more than you should be um, and just basically getting a grasp on how much you're using. Uh, you can't find problems unless you're really monitoring and looking for them. And I think that's a really good first step for any kind of business, just really nail down where you might be losing something. Sure, being able to keep track of it yeah. is priority number one, yeah. and then seeing what you can do with it, priority number two. Yeah. For sure. You don't know unless you know. Exactly. <laughs> and again, with, you know, I think some, some places have started out with it, sustainability in mind. And you really don't know, you, you can't know things that you have not encountered yet. Right. So being able to say, this is where I'm at. Maybe this is where I'd like to be in a year. This mm -hmm. is where I'd like to be in five years. Yeah. And being able to take those baby steps. The baby steps are the most important yeah, part. Yeah, adds up to the big stuff. For mm -hmm. sure. I enjoy really pretty much anything that you brew. I enjoy the IPAs, I enjoy the sours, I enjoy the stouts, anything in between. So I'm just thankful that you guys are here and yeah. you're able to do what you can for the environment, for our community here, giving back on so many different levels and paying attention to so many different aspects of sustainability because you can and you've noticed and you care to do better. I well, we're happy to be fun. here. <laughs> <laughs> Cedar Falls and Waterloo are really happy to have you. Well, thank you so much for joining me and yes, letting me come me. into your space. And so much fun. 
That was a good time. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Yes, thank you. And again, you can find them on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook. You can see some of Rachel's handiwork there under Single Speed Tap Room Waterloo. Yeah, we have Single Speed Waterloo, Single Speed CF Tap Room, and Single Speed Brewing Co. So wonderful. Follow all three. <laughs> all of the things. And then they also have a lot of their sustainability information on their website. Really easy for everybody to see. If you're curious about some of the efforts that they're putting forth to keeping their breweries sustainable, giving back to the community, and even recycling an entire building. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.